is 72601. How old are you now? 80. 80 this year. Uh, <clears throat> what branch were you in? Uh, Army. In the Army? Yeah. And do you recall your dates of service, like even if it's just from year to year? Uh, <clears throat> it would be from, uh, I think, October 1942 to October 1945. And uh, what was your job? Well, <clears throat> it would be... What were you trained to do? Uh, it was just basic... Infantry, infantry training, yeah. basic <clears throat> infantry training. What was the highest rank you achieved? Uh, second lieutenant. And uh, <clears throat> you were in Europe, right? Yes. European theater? Yes. ETO, ETO. as we would say. Yeah. And uh, what were the major campaigns you were involved in? Uh, Normandy, Northern France, Belgium, Holland. Yeah. That's the second one. Yeah. Northern France. No, uh, no, Northern France, Belgium, Holland. Yeah. Um, I, I think it would be like the Central Plains, German Central Plains. I think that's what they called it. The bulge, yeah, and uh, uh, I, I don't know what the last one was called. Final uh, campaign in Germany. Yeah, there were five major campaigns in Europe, and I was in all of them, and well, I have five <coughs> battle stars. <coughs> What do you get the battle start for? Each campaign. All right. <coughs> there were yeah. oh, there, no. there there were five Time. there were five <coughs> campaigns there I think in in in, in northern Europe anyway that didn't mm -hmm. count like uh, you know when they invaded France from the, in the south but the, but I have five battle stars right. meaning mm -hmm. I was in five major campaigns. Wow. All right. <coughs> So, let's get a little bit of background. You went in in October 1942? Well, I, I was in uh, reserve at that time, uh -huh. and I went on active duty uh, in, uh, in July of 43. I was in the uh, Enlisted Reserve Corps. I was in law school at the time, and uh, it, I just didn't get called. I didn't get called. And finally, in March of... Uh, 43 I was called into active duty mm -hmm. but uh, the, the, the law school because I was in my fifth semester out of the six and because of the war they would allow the law students to take the bar exam at the end of the fifth semester instead of having to wait for right. the sixth semester. So anyway I got called in in March of 43 to active duty and the law school said well We'll ask the Army if uh, you could, you and another fellow, fellow student, could stay out until you took the bar exam in June of 43. And I thought, come on, they're not going to pay any attention to you on that. And they wrote down to Governor's Island or someplace, and they wrote back, by all means, let the young men take the bar exam. Tell us when it is, and we'll cut their orders right afterward, which is what they did. So we took the bar exam, and, and a week or two after that, we went on active duty. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you actually had your law degree then? Uh, no, I did. Uh, uh, because when I, I got out of service in October 45, mm -hmm. I had to go back to school and do that semester, even though I had passed the bar. Okay. Yeah, because they didn't have the time in, see. Mm -hmm. You still had to have the the time in. I, and I actually didn't graduate from law school until January 46. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went back 
Yeah, I got I got out in uh, October, early in October, I think, of '45, and um, and and there was time enough to you know a number enough days left in that semester to qualify for uh, attending that semester, mm -hmm. and that's what I did. And and the, and the fellow that that I took the bar exam with, he he came back about that same time, and he also took that semester. We graduated together. Hmm. That's all. Yeah. There were very few in the class left, you know, in the, mm -hmm. uh, when I think in our class, when uh, Cunningham and I were went on active duty, I think there was only about, uh, oh, maybe 11 students left, and they were all probably 4F and like that. That's mm -hmm. all. But uh, I went into, uh, while well, I had basic infantry training, I went into the armored oh, you did? Uh, part of the uh, Army at Fort Knox. Armored. Uh, so what was that? What was it called? Tanks. What? Pardon? <clears throat> was it the 3rd Armored? Was it with Patton? Or? Oh, it was a, uh, well, uh, I, I took armored uh, training also with in basic infantry at Fort Knox which is yeah. the armored center right. and um, when I got overseas I was assigned to uh, 743rd tank battalion now that was 743rd tank battalion mm -hmm. that was a separate battalion that would be attached to uh, infantry divisions mm -hmm. as opposed to an armored division I never was in an armored division. It was always in, in the in this separate battalion, and we were attached initially to the first infantry division, uh -huh. and then we were attached to the 30th infantry division, and we stayed with them through the rest of the war. So, did you have any tank training in uh, that respect? Or? I had uh, in, in at Fort Knox. No. Well, yeah. At all. I yeah, mean, at Fort Knox. Yeah, I had, uh, you know, we were showing how to drive the tank. Did you do that, though, when you were over in Europe? Oh, yeah. When my uh, my first assignment, uh, I, I was a bow gunner okay. in the tank. Bow gunner is the assistant driver, so to speak. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, the bow gunner is probably the lowest form of humanity <laughs> that ever was. Why is that? Uh, <laughs> Uh, you would take over for the driver if something happened to the driver. So at first, I I, I was a bow gunner in in uh, in the tank for a uh, uh, number of months, really. This is a Sherman tank you're talking about? No, I I I, uh, I first was in, yes. We had three companies of Sherman tanks, one uh, medium tanks that were, and one company of light tanks, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I spent very little time uh, in the uh, medium tank, and I was assigned to D Company, Dog Company, which was a company of light tanks. Mm -hmm. Light tank has a crew of four, medium tank a crew of five. The difference in, in a uh, medium tank, you got your driver, bow gunner, loader, gunner, tank commander. Light tank, driver, bow gunner, gunner, and tank commander. And uh, the tank commander in the light tank had to fulfill uh, the uh, functions of a loader because you'd have, like, uh, you'd have a ready box for the shell and you could slam it into the breech mm -hmm. and, and the gunner would be, you know, to the side and taking care of the gun, manipulating it around. So. First, I was a bow gunner, and then, and then um, the uh, driver of the tank I was in was moved to one of the uh, medium companies, and that's when I became the driver. Probably in, uh, let's see, I got to 743rd in uh, July, I think it was, of 1944 in Normandy. Now, the the uh, battalion I was with some of the units of it went in on D-Day. Mm -hmm. I did not go in on D-Day. 
it was sometime later that I, I went from England to <clears throat> to Normandy. And uh, so initially, as I say, I was a bow gunner. And then uh, from in, in July of 44, mm -hmm. and then uh, October, I was the driver of that tank. And uh, whereabouts were you then in October? In October, probably we were. Uh, Northern France? Oh no, I think we by that time we were, uh, we'd been through France, Northern France, and through Belgium. By that time in October, we were at the Siegfried Line. Mm -hmm. Right, just before, into Germany. This would have been right before the balls did, the battle of the balls. All the balls didn't start till uh, December, December 19th. Yeah. And that's <clears throat> December 19th. Uh, so where were you when the balls started, and what were your impressions of? I mean, when it's the German counterattack began, where were you, and what were you doing? Well, we were in Germany. We were uh, uh, just north of Aachen. Aachen had been a hell of a battle, of course. Big fight in uh, November. Were you involved in that battle? Uh, yeah, pushing off? Yes, uh, portions of it, yeah. There, you know, it would be a big, big area, big, big, you know, yeah. around Aachen and surrounding area, Hurtgen Forest. And uh, we were, uh, we were, uh, oh, I can't think of all the names now, like Kohlscheid. We were probably not far from Cologne, uh, northern Germany. And we, we were then in the uh, Ninth Army. We'd been moved from the First Army into the Ninth Army. And um, we were waiting, waiting to cross what was known as the Rohr River. Huh? They had some dams. Uh, in northern Germany there, and they were afraid that the Germans were going to uh, uh, destroy them, shell those uh, dams, you know, break them, to flood the whole area to make it almost impossible for infantry, certainly tanks, mm -hmm. to uh, get across that area and get toward the Rhine. So we were, uh, we were somewhat northeast of uh, the Ardennes in Belgium and uh, waiting to uh, cross the Rohr River, hoping to get across before they, mm -hmm. they, uh, they burst the dams. And uh, that's when we had quite a setback. But I, I can remember uh, that uh, all of a sudden we were told to uh, pack up. We're moving out. and. Uh, that would have been on the 19th of December. And uh, at that time, uh, by that time, I was the tank commander and moved from, I went, I, I, I went fast when I moved from bow gunner, driver, and then the tank commander. And at that time, in, in early December, I was the tank commander. Our, our, our tank commander uh, just had had enough. He was, couldn't keep anything down. He was shell shocked, I guess yeah. you'd call it. And, uh, and uh, he couldn't do anything. I was driving at the time, and the gunner we had was a very good, experienced man, so we could kind of operate in the tank because he couldn't do anything. And uh, we thought, you know, it all just it was terrible, ordeal for him. And so they did uh, then take him out, and, and after he left, and they made me the tank commander. So then we packed up and uh, down on the bulge we go. We had to go back, uh, you know, down past Aachen. I think we went through Aachen and uh, uh, to the uh, northern part of the bulge. We were in the Malmody Stavelot area of really? the bulge. Wow. Yeah. There were some bad things happening oh, yeah. in Malmody. That's where the Germans. You were going through there before that incident took place, though, right? Uh, we were there before, and, and uh, <clears throat> I say before, we were in the area before it happened. Uh, we, uh, but um, I, think that happened I don't think we were right in Mel Melmody at, no. at the time, but they left the uh, bodies of those guys there for a while, make sure everybody saw them, you know, they'd be frozen anyway. 
but they wanted to make sure that they saw the atrocity that would work you up. Stavlot was a bad place too. The SS were in Stavlot and they just killed people. They were, they were a bad crowd. And we were near St. Vith, St. Vith, Stavlot, Melmody, and through there. And then after the bulge, well, then we went back up into where we had been. We crossed the Roar, <coughs> we crossed the Rhine, and then we, uh, then uh, I'd say uh, April, there was very little resistance, and uh, we just moved fast, always kept on the move, and we'd carry infantry on the tanks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they'd ride so we could, and, and very little resistance, run into a few pockets. And uh, then we went, we were going to the Elbe River, and we ended up in a place called Magdeburg, M-A-G-D-E-B-U-R-G, -A -A -E Magdeburg. That was once, uh, it was a big town, it was once the uh, uh, home of the kings of, uh, Prussia or something up and through there, Magdeburg. And uh, that was on the Elbe River, and that was the line where they had agreed uh, would be the limit as far as the uh, United States Army would go, and left the rest open for the Russians. We were about 40 miles from Berlin. And we got there on May 1st, and uh, the war ended on May 8th, officially, mm -hmm. but we didn't go any further. It was wide open. We could have walked into uh, Berlin. They weren't going to oppose us, the Germans. They were. I, I think they probably would have let us into Berlin. They're afraid of the Russians. Oh man! And uh, did you meet any Russians? Yes, we met Russians. What was your impression of them? Well, the only time I saw them, we after after we were there, and the war ended. Now we're in what ultimately became the Russian zone. So we would have to, we'd be in a place for a while, and then we'd have to move out as the Russians would come in and take over. We kept moving, kind of, as I recall, kind of moving south all the time. So we were in a place called uh, Plauen, P-L-A-U-E-N. It, it was a big city, good-sized city. And um, there was a prisoner of war camp there. And a uh, prisoner of war camp, uh, had both SS, German SS, and German Wehrmacht, just regular army guys, just regular guys that got mm -hmm. drafted and put in. So uh, they knew that the Russians were going to come in and take over that area too. So they worked like crazy uh, discharging the Wehrmacht guys. But they didn't find time to um, um, What's the word I'm groping for? Uh, uh, well, to uh, administer to the uh, SS, you know, get, getting them out. What's so, the is this the Americans? The Americans. Okay. Yeah, we're in charge of the camp, you see. And uh, they were getting these Fairmont guys out because they somehow they sensed what was going to happen when those Russians got there. Oh, yeah. And nobody cared about the SS troops. Oh. <laughs> so they just didn't do a thing about them, you see, just because they, they were too too busy doing the paperwork for all the Vermont guys. Get them out. So uh, as it turned out, uh, our, our unit, 743rd Tank Battalion, was the last group in the, in the town. And I remember uh, People were around the town. They they didn't fear the Americans at all. And uh, as I recall, I think it was a Sunday morning, and uh, must have been some communist in, in the city of Plauen uh, clashed downtown with uh, I guess the residents. I've kind of forgotten how that was. But we got we got called to break up this sort of riot and everything, and. Uh, Oh, they were going it and fighting and and were they civilian communists, German Pardon? communists? They must be. I don't. Yeah. yeah. And uh, anyway, it was some confrontation between these two cultures, and it was kind of fun breaking it up. You know? 
<laughs> yeah, we could build some if you wanted to. And I can remember I was standing there, kind of calmed down. There's an old German came up to me, and he's shaking his head. He says to me, you Americans, you always fight the wrong people. He, he feared those Russians. Oh, yeah. And I never forgot that. He said, you Americans, you always fight the wrong people. But anyway, because the next day, the Russians were coming in to take over and to take over the camp and the whole bit. And I happened to be with the last group that was there because we had to turn over the key to the okay. to the um, Soviet. prisoner of war camp there. Uh, <laughs> Fenced in there. And uh, that morning, as they knew the Russians coming, there wasn't a soul on those streets, nobody. Shades were pulled. They knew what was coming. They knew what was going to happen. And those Russians, they sent in, uh, you know, like second rate the troops dregs. and the dregs. And, and, and what got me is that we waited and I could see them coming, came down, horse drawn uh, vehicles. And, and I remember like those, you know, like the Indians, what, what did those Indians call it? Wiki Wackies or something where the the, the ponies would pull, you know, oh, yeah. the, uh, like, uh, you know, be sticks or something uh -huh. and, 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 you know, uh -huh. at, a, at an angle and stuff like that. And, and I, they had weapons. And boy, they came down in, in combat array on each side of the street walking along the curbs. The, the, the guys on one side watching the other side looking up for snipers or whatever. You think it was combat was on, you know war had been over by then several weeks. Same thing, the column on the other side in horse-drawn vehicles. And here comes a, the, the colonel. And you know, I, I was always a great guy going to the movies and he was just like, just like the, the Russian colonel we would be portrayed in the movies, you know, just stern, stocky and everything. Mm -hmm. Of course, he did not speak English very well and we didn't know much Russian, I can tell you and we just handed him the key. Nobody said anything. And I got to tell you, I was very happy to get out of there and leave. That's how, I, it was eerie. But it was eerie in that town. There wasn't a sound, just these, the, the sound of the horses' hoofs and the okay. guys clomping, all the people, the they residents, so they scared. knew, they knew, and, and it did happen. They, they had big, big problems. But that, that's I mean, how, like what? Oh, they would uh, murder, they'd rape, steal everything, mm -hmm. and they'd rape the women. And the SS guys? Huh? The SS men in the camp? Well, though, those guys, a lot of those guys got transported to uh, Russia, I think, and, uh, and uh, put to work in the salt mines or whatever. Oh, yeah, they would take, they just, but, they, but you could hardly blame them after what the Germans did to the Russians in Russia. They were just as bad. They were bad, vicious. Oh, they had a vengeance. That's for sure. Yep. 20 million Russians? The Russians. Well, they lost 20 million people. Yes, they did. At yes, least. they did. <clears throat> oh boy, did they ever. I've been to the Soviet Union a couple of times. Yes. When it was the Soviet Union. Yes. I've been to Leningrad. I've been to some of these mass cemeteries. And yeah. The eternal flames, the hero cities, I mean, they just don't let you forget, and they shouldn't forget. And they should. No. Oh, no, you're right. There were 20 million people. They, they, can you imagine? Can you imagine such a thing? And then when, as you said, the Russians came in to Germany, <clears throat> look out. You <clears throat> bet. Because they were, they were, they wanted it. They wanted now, a lot it. of the, uh, I understand, too, a lot of the uh, reason for the uh, Iron Curtain, they didn't want a lot of the, uh, common Russian soldier to see uh, all the uh, advantages of, of Western civilization right. and all the, you know, the modern conveniences. And, and Germany did, even in the rubble, you could tell Germany had been a progressive right. place, as opposed to France. I was not impressed with what I saw in France. <laughs> Germans were... Well, you know what they, they were. They, they were a methodical, uh, talented people. But there was another, there was another 
problem because of what happened after the First World War and, and the way and the way uh, Clemenceau and Orlando and David Lloyd George the retribution they demanded of Germany it was it was not wise. Mm -hmm. That I don't think. No. So, do you remember where you were when the war ended? I was in uh, Magdeburg. Magdeburg. On the on May eighth. On May eighth, yeah. Uh, they told us. Uh, I can remember about the first or second of uh, of May. Uh, our company commander was Cowboy Henderson. I don't know why we called him Cowboy Henderson. He was a Georgia boy, captain. And uh, there was some kind of a big hall or something in this place. And they called the whole company in there. And he said, uh, boys, the war is over. And nobody said a word. Nobody said a word. Uh, we weren't. We weren't going. I guess we weren't going to allow ourselves to have hope or a good feeling. We'd been there too long, mm -hmm. and uh, we couldn't anything. feel anything. And you were afraid to have any elation because you just. Uh, is this really true? We better wait and see because we didn't trust things at the time. That's all. Nobody said a word. Not a word. And you would have been around 23 or 24? I would have been... Uh, then? I would have been 20, 24, 24 years old. So you... And I would have been in combat uh, about eight months or nine months, a long time. That's that's like a hundred years to to survive. To make it through? To make it through. Man, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't even... I couldn't remember almost another life. It seemed like, gee, did I really live in Johnstown, New York? Did I really, you know, know people there? Did I, you know, just wooey? <laughs> yeah, I can. Or what? Or was this? Or is this the real? Is this? Has it all? Has it always been this? Weird. Weird. Did you ever have any real close calls? You must have. Yes. Yeah. Uh, was your tank ever hit? No, my tank was never hit. That's uh, got to be pretty rare for eight months. Well, uh, I suppose. Yeah, we. Um, I thought we thought I was hit one time. This is when I was still the bow gunner. We we had run to um, a situation where. Uh, we didn't know there was armor, and uh, we ran into it, and uh, we took cover in some woods. And uh, of course, they had the woods zeroed in, <laughs> so they're dumping all kinds of big stuff in there, and um, a shell hit and exploded. On the on the right side of our tank, artillery won't hurt you too much uh, in the tank when you're buttoned up. Concussion can hurt you. Did you know that? If it's close and you're buttoned up, you know how it uh, concussion could uh, that pressure somehow could kill you. But anyway, um, shell came in, struck. Now uh, there's all of a sudden there's a whole lot of smoke in the tank and uh and Schulte was still there and geez we're hit get out of here so uh if a tank is hit you got about three seconds to get out the reason you only got that is because uh, if, if the tank is hit and a, and, a sh and a shell strikes in there gets in the, it'll set off the ammunition in the tank and the tank will burn so you know this so here's all the smoke and, and we're hit, so naturally you got to get out. I can remember opening that hatch, and, and, and I started out along with the driver. Now the tank commander and the gunner scrambled off, the, uh, they got out of the turret, scrambled back behind the tank somehow. So Earl Dance, he was the driver, and I, 
we start up. Here comes another Chicago cop. Bloom! <laughs> Very close. She's to get back down in. What are we going to do? They're shelling outside. The tank is going to blow off and everything. Fortunately, it was not any kind of a drug hit. The tank was really not hit. It, the, the shell was next to it and, and made the tank lurch. And of course, the, the, uh, the uh, smoke and everything from the explosion was what was in the tank. But we went about three times to, to get out. And you know, the, and you could feel the, uh, when, the, when the shells coming in, you could feel that on your face, you know. Yeah. And, <laughs> and we back down looking at each other and panic, panic, because you, you figure that the tank has got to go any minute. But it wasn't. Yeah, okay, so that was okay. Then, uh, How'd you get out of it? How'd you get out oh, of it? Oh, well, we realized the tank wasn't hit because if, if it's not burning by then, so we just stayed there. You just sat And tight. they finally let and sat out the artillery barrage, that's all. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and no. And and I think the about the only casualty of the of the group in there was a kid from Chicago who lost his hearing because of concussion. And I thought, what a lucky guy, because he they took him out of there. He's going home, he, you know. But he's alive. And, you know, you gee, you'd give up your hearing or anything to get out of there alive. <laughs> You know, you heard those uh, expression, million dollar wound. Right, yeah. <laughs> oh, gee, you, you prayed for a million dollar wound. <laughs> Got it, man. Anything. Oh, gee. Oh, I only lost an arm, man, but I'm alive, right? Oh, God, isn't that ridiculous? That's the way it was, God. Oh, man. Oh, there's another time. Uh, tanks always should have infantry with them. You can't, you know, if you're in the tank, you can't, you can't go out scouting, you can't. See all the way around. See, yeah. So if you're, uh, you know, when you, wherever you are, there's, there should be infantry mm -hmm. available. So there's one time, there's always goof-ups, you know. And uh, we were supposed to go in and take this town, little hamlet, like out in the country, be like, uh, Fort Ann, maybe. If, mm -hmm. No, it wasn't as big as that, but something like that. So, um, I, I and like like everything else, we're, we're we're drawn up and we're waiting to go. We're in a column, and the infantry is nearby. The guys going with it, and they would be, and they would probably pile on the back, you know, on the deck of the of, of each tank, a whole bunch of them, and others might just walk in along with you. And, uh, but we're not moving and there's a delay and everything. And now it's starting to get dark, it's kind of dusk. This would have been around uh, in November, I think. That was, uh, yeah, that would have been the, about the last that, that did Schulte in. And, and uh, at that time I, I, was, I was driving, I was a tank driver. And just before I, I, I became a tank commander because of probably because of this incident. So anyway, it's getting dusk, and finally somebody goes, all right, come on, move those tanks out, let's go. <clears throat> so we went, and, and, and to go in this town, uh, it would be like, uh, well, it, it, from where we were down into the town was a wide open area on both sides kind of an old dirt road like mm -hmm. travel but we've got to go down this road now we know they've got this zeroed in you don't you just don't go to a place right. like that where it's wide open you know it's zeroed in so anyway but they made us go and away we went and I remember uh, our best bet was to race now with a light tank you can go well, I, I think we could get that up if I and I've kind of forgotten things but I think we could get that up almost to 40 miles an hour wow. I think. Now I'm not sure. If you got my, the right terrain. My, but I, yeah, yeah, right. But you could get it going pretty good. And so there were five, five tanks. Our platoon. There's, by the way, that's what's in a in a company. There are three platoons of tanks, and a platoon is five tanks. Mm -hmm. 
So down the road we go. No infantry because they made us move, see, and infantry way back now. So we're racing down the road and that's I hadn't been driving too long and that's when we had a brand new uh, bow gunner. Uh, so I said, Jesus, and, and on the bow gunner side, you know, the uh, um, levers are there and if if you can't drive from the from the left side, where we're, you just pull those levers down, you can drive from that side. So, do you know how to do it? Yes, he knew about that. Now, I never, uh, in, in, uh, in a tank, you can pull down the turret, and uh, no, the, um, not the turret, the, what am I trying to say? You know, like on a ship. Periscope. Well, there's a periscope, yeah. You know. The hatch? The hatch. The hatch. In, in the hatch, <coughs> there's a periscope. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think I could see much out of that periscope, you're crazy. I never could. So when I drove, I, I always had my hatch open, mm -hmm. but you could let the seat down so I could just creep up. And, and I could I could just put my my eye just above the uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the hatch, see, and and could certainly use the the uh, levers. But anyway, there I was. So I said, now, do you, do you know how to do it? Yes. I said, now, if I get hit, you've got to pull those down, and you've got to keep the thing going. Well, of course, as I said, they got it zeroed in. So, of course, as we're going, the artillery shells are hitting, and, of course, they hit close, and then shrapnel and dirt and rocks would come flying in, you know, and everything. So I'd see him, there'd be kind of an explosion, and he'd figure, and then there'd be a whole clattering and all the crap. <laughs> I'd see him reach, no, no, I'm still, I'm not here yet, I tell <laughs> So we made it. So we pulled up, we pulled up, and it, it was a kind of a, gee, I think it was about a three or four story brick structure. I remember I pulled the tank around and uh, up again, and now the, 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 the firing was coming from that way. So. I put the, the building between where the crowds were firing from and, and, and where I put the tank. At that point, we all buttoned up, including me. Mm -hmm. Well, they kept throwing that artillery all night long. And it, they would hit, be hitting these buildings, and it would hit the one where we, Nick could hear the bricks and stuff come hitting, no, falling down on us. Now we know we got no infantry. We know we're caught. We can't get out yeah. because if you get out, you're going to get killed with that the the, the, the uh, volume of artillery they're throwing in. So uh, during the night, I, I realized I'm going to die. I'm going to die. This is it. We cannot get out. And I I got to tell you, it was okay. I I, I when when I. When I accepted it, it was like peaceful. I, don't, I didn't fight it. You, you just know it. that's as far as it goes. Nothing you can do. I, I can't explain it except that I wasn't troubled. Mm -hmm. I wasn't panic-stricken. In fact, I was <coughs> quiet. And everybody in the tank had been quiet. We all just sat there. Nobody saying, "Well, long about during the night sometime." Poor Schulte, the guy I told you about. Yeah. He says, um, I heard him on he's, he's up in the turret behind me, and I heard, oh, what did a man ever do to deserve this? Well, I got thinking about that, see, and I got thinking about some of the things I had done in life that I kind of <laughs> regretted, see, and I thought, jeez, I hope these guys never find out all the bad things I did that I'm getting paid back for and that they're <laughs> suffering for. I just kind of that's all I could think about. Jeez, I hope they never I did. I thought, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. I wish I hadn't done that. That's probably why I'm paying for this. And these poor guys, I hope they never find out it's my fault. 
but we survived the night. No, as we survived the Did night. Did all five tanks survive? They all survived. And, uh, yeah, nothing happened. Germans didn't come in to take us. See, that's what I figured they'd be in with grenades that they'd somehow right. finish us off, that's all. They never came. But they kept shelling. And they shelled all day long the next day. We don't move. We can't move. They shelled all the next night. Wow. You still in the tank? Still in the tank. Um, if you had to go to the bathroom, you'd have, uh, like, uh, you could use your helmet, pee in, kind of get that hatch open, throw it out. That's all you could do. And um, I think we had, you know, those uh, K rations. They were packages you'd have, like, uh, canned, like, meatloaf or something. Mm -hmm. and bad stuff. Cheese, that cheese. Oh, jeez. That was... You know, you hardly chew it. And anyway, and so shelled all that, day, and all the next night. And then the following day, I, I and I can't remember now if it, it, it either let up a little bit, but, but we moved from where we were you know, that rubble was all going around. And we went to a great big building, and I think all the tanks went, it would, it would put your mind, as I can re recall, like a big airplane hangar of some kind. I don't know what it was. Mm -hmm. But we got in there under undercover. And, you know, like planes come over, they couldn't see it. And I think we got still shell that, that, that day after we moved in, then it was over. That's all. But that was, that was, boy, you were a little, you were a little shaky after that because it was just, you, and, and they're so methodical, you could time it. And they, they, they were famous for that. You're probably aware of that, mm -hmm. aren't you? That they were famous for being methodical in what they did. Oh, yeah. Very methodical. Mm -hmm. But if you could tell, here's this plate. This is it. I, that, Frondhoven, that was the name of that place, Frondhoven. And the reason I remember is because the, the fellow who was the gunner of my tank, we, we still keep in contact. Oh, he, yeah. he later got it. I got a battlefield commission, and so did he later on. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, he got his own tank. But anyway, you, that happened because people get killed and sure. you take their place. Yeah. But uh, what was I going to say? But I, I'll never figure, like I said, here's this little dump of a hamlet. Why did they keep shelling? What did they think was there? Or did they think that there was a big... Uh, m maybe maybe they thought there was a plan by the uh, units order, there yeah. to, to have a big push from this place so they were going to break up or stop the attack of, of a whole, uh, you know, several divisions or something. Mm -hmm. But anyway, why they kept shelling that, a that lot of place? place you know? Yeah! And, and never came in. Hmm. I mean, they'd have had, a, we were like... When would that have been? Would that have been 44 or 45? That was 44. Yeah, that was in, uh, November 44. Okay. Hmm. November 44, just just before Thanksgiving. So you're pushing think. north then? We were... Uh, going northeast? Well, we were going northeast, yeah. We yeah. were in Germany. That was in Germany, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was toward, you know, going toward that Rhone <laughs> River and everything. Did you guys ever have a chance to take German POWs yourself, or did we what? Did, well, did, as did, you're pushing through, and did you ever encounter Germans who had surrendered, or yes. trying to surrender? Yes, yes, we would. Uh, we uh, from time to time we, we would uh, uh, get through somewhere, and, and, and they couldn't get anywhere, and, and they and the, and they would give up and we just hold them there and and some and somebody would be assigned to march them back to some rear area I don't know where mm -hmm. back behind uh, late in the war of course they they gave up and drove you right. did you did need to uh, can I can I tell you a funny story about sure. that? this would have been uh, near the end of the war and I remember it was we were on a roadblock 
I don't even know why the hell we were on a roadblock then. But anyway, we were. And uh, I remember our, our tank, it was a, a crossroads. There was a nice great big tree with a lot of uh, leaves, a beautiful big tree. A warehouse-like building to the left, and I had the tank parked underneath this tree up against that warehouse, facing uh, the road down that way. And it would be late in April, it was warm, it was a nice day. And uh, I sat out on top of the tank. Uh, you had to take turns on guard, you might say. <clears throat> But during the day, most everybody would be around. At night, we would, we would, uh, we would try uh, uh, an hour. I, let me see. Yeah, I think we, we would we would take our guard duty. Uh, somebody always had to be on duty and awake. One one hour on, and three off. Didn't sleep much some of that three hours, but you know. anyway, but during the day, I don't know, they didn't have to take turns. Somebody always had to be there and on the tank that it was parked. But it was a nice day, I could see it, yeah. And uh, geez, I'm looking down the road and I thought I heard a sound. There's a whole column of Germans walking down. And I was just sitting there because it was warm and nice. I didn't have my helmet on. I, uh, now, our weapon was a Tommy gun, a Thompson submachine gun. And I, my Tommy gun was in the turret somewhere. I did have a 45 uh, revolver. And I guess I had that on. But anyway, I look down, here comes these crooks. Gee. I could tell by the, the walk they're not going to do any fighting, and I couldn't even see any gunnery. I remember, I thought, oh boy, here's my chance. There may be some uh, P-38s or, or uh, uh, that other famous German revolver. Luger? Luger. Get a souvenir? Well, yeah, or, but you could sell them to the Air Corps. They'd pay you $1,000. Oh, really? Oh, they, well, they had money, the trophy, guys yeah. in the Air Force, see, in the Air Force, but they couldn't get this stuff, these souvenirs. They weren't on the ground. They, so, they had, so they didn't know what to do with them when they had so. And, of course, I would want a P-38 myself, but if I had a chance to sell them. So anyway, I thought, oh, man, they got to be there. Oh, there must have been 50 guys in that column. Had to be. I got them off the tank and I ran down the road toward them, you know, and they saw me coming and they stopped. So they said, uh, I think they said surrender in America. Maybe they said comrade, I don't know. Uh, oh, I know what they said. Prisonia, prisonia. Prisoners. They want to be prisoners. Prisonia, prisonia. I said, okay. I said, uh, pistola, nix pistola. Nix pistola. You know, they're not going to have any guns. They're assuring me that they're free of guns and they're not going to be any trouble. You know, and I said, Nix pistola, Nix prisonia. The hell with you. And I turned my back on them and walked away. He said, Jeez, they start trotting right in, right behind me. Prisoni. <laughs> so, yeah. so I stopped again and said, Pistola, Nix, Nix. Go on. I said, Nix. And, and I walked. And I start back down my back to no gun, nothing. <laughs> Jeez, they come trotting after me. So finally, I said, all right, I too. Now, I could see they were, they were not these great German warriors, believe me. And they'd been, you know, kids and old men and just pulled in, you know. And I said, I too. I mean, boy, they did do that. And they said, okay, forward march. They knew what that meant. Hup, hup. And boy, we marched right down to the crossroad. And around the corner was a was a CP, a command post. And I just, I marched them there and, and left, left. <laughs> but, there, but there wasn't, there wasn't. Of course, those guys wouldn't have pistols. There was no officer with them right. uh, that I recall. <laughs> but you had to see them trotting after me when I threw my no, I said, I don't know, no, Nick Prisoni, you can't have that. Oh, man. That's funny.
That's funny. That's funny. Well, uh, things like that kept you sure. going. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Kept you going. But other than that, oh, I, yes, there would be. When did I have close calls? Every day was not every day, but when you encountered sure. uh, stuff flying at you, you, you sure you had problems. Did you ever? Uh, I guess. Did you ever have contact with like the German population, the civilians and stuff? No, because um, we were always on the line. Oh, yeah. And uh, we never really got pulled off the uh, the line, and so they had pretty much, you know, when we got somewhere, that it, because it was battle going, the, the people had pretty much gotten out of there. I don't mm -hmm. recall uh, that I have no no we get in a place the population had been they they they'd gone they 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 knew what I suppose was coming. Did I see uh, uh, people that, um, you know, taking their, I, I would see people like uh, coming our, our way, carrying their clothes. Refugees? And, huh? People whose houses have been destroyed or I guess, trying yeah. to flee to fight. Trying to, yeah, or trying to get out of there. and. and uh, Yes, yeah, so once in a while, but I mean, we would be on that goal. They were just, we didn't bother them. And uh, like I say, that, 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 that guy that day, I had that contact in, mm -hmm. in Plown after the war when he said, you Americans, you always fight right. the wrong people. But during uh, the actual fighting the war, no, we, we weren't. Uh, now, uh, in, uh, in, at one point, while we were in the bulge, Believe it or not, we, we uh, and it was in Malmody, and I can't, this would have been in uh, uh, December or early January of late, you know, late December 44, or early January 45, uh, and while we were in, in Malmody, they, uh, things had quieted, I guess, so it was in the latter stages of the, bulge, uh, we would um, go out during the day, it was like, like going to work, but at about 8 o'clock in the morning we'd, we'd be called and we'd have to go some place like to relieve troops. I remember one day there was some uh, uh, infantry uh, who had run into a firefight with some Germans, all infantry and I guess no, no armor. And uh, because they didn't want to send our light tanks against German army because armor because we could with 37 millimeter guns all we had on the light tanks, mm -hmm. 75 millimeter on the mediums, but uh, and those Germans had the 88. Big bad. Yeah. That baby was the greatest gun that ever was. The 88. They used it for uh, any aircraft. They used it for artillery, and they used it on the tanks. And an anti tank gun, everything. Oh man, that could. That could they could, that thing they could fire an 88 I guess go two miles and still no okay. still go through a tank I think I think so it was a long way anyhow um, but we like for example we were told there's a group of uh, American wounded and they were they were pinned down somehow and so we were told you've got to go up and clean up that nest of Germans and, and uh, get those wounded back. So we would, we'd go up and and uh, and, and would because we, we would have that our, a lot of firepower and infantry couldn't do anything about that. German infantry, so, and then we could help them. And then whatever else, and, but then we'd pull back at night. But at got some point we were able to pull back into Melmody and they said, look, if you can find a place to, to uh, sleep or stay, Go ahead. And I remember we, uh, uh, and it was a melody, and they went to this house. But just like you see in the pictures, you know how those uh, kind of French houses, you know, like, like three stories, you know, be and everything. And I went there and I can remember, um, and I could speak a little French from high school. 
we had uh, our, our bow gunner at the time was was uh, Hot Lips Haverlock. I can't remember Hot Lips' first name now. Hot Lips Haverlock. He could speak some German, so we were in good shape. We could do all kinds of things. See, so I said, "Avez uh, vous uh, what's bed leet or something like that? Avez vous leet pour quatre ans?" And uh, have you got a bed for four men? This woman was very nice, and uh, we we stayed in her home, and uh, they had and could we hadn't had a bed in months, and uh, my God, she had like those big comforter feather bed mm -hmm. type of things or whatever, <laughs> whatever they are, and of course we we we. Uh, on, on, when, when they could get rations to us, we weren't too bad because they'd have, for tanks, for the tankers, we could have um, five and one rations, it was a big box, and, and they'd have things like, you'd watch for one, we'd have bacon in it, one of it, and, and, I, and uh, all some kind of meat or something. They, mm -hmm. they, they, they weren't bad rations. Well, stuff that she had, she was in bad shape because they didn't have much to eat in those areas and everything. And she would take that stuff and fix it up. We couldn't hardly eat some like crap, but but she would fix it and, and cook for us. Mm -hmm. And we'd stay there. She had, uh, I think, two sons, not not three. I think I remember two sons. And of course, where that Melody was, that's sort of uh, on the border between right. Germany and and Belgium. The two sons were in the German army. No kid. Oh yeah, they they just took them. And I think they were on the Russian front. Uh, so you can imagine what that was. Yeah. But anyway, that, that woman was so nice to us. We were nice to her, too. You know, and then gave her as much food as we could get and everything. We were there about maybe three, four days, I guess. Uh -huh. I, I can't remember. But that, that was a contact. But she was, she was uh, Flemish, you know, Belgian. Oh, she was a nice woman. Oh, yeah. Two boys. Isn't it, wasn't that something? She was taking yeah. care of us with a two boys and the... Well, she probably wanted to be over too. But that bulge, the, the, one of the worst things in bulge was the cold. Yeah. It was so cold. If you talked any... Oh, I have. Gotten been in there. The frostbite. And we had no winter clothes. A lot of those guys were out in the open. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We had to stay in the... We, we lived in the, in the tank. You couldn't, you know, like Did Melbourne really? at that time. But initially, you couldn't, there was no place to go, you were out in the field, you, and you didn't know what was what because they, they had uh, Germans dressed in GI uniforms, you know about that, mm -hmm. and uh, you were just so confused, you didn't know who was who, and of course it wasn't very comfortable being in the, in the tank in that cold, on cold steel, mm. you were not very warm. Yeah. Uh, start with Bruce and I, he was... Uh, uh, we would take our shoes off sometimes to rub our feet, to, so we wouldn't get they wouldn't Circulation freeze back in. Yeah, but uh, that was it was a so cold. But we had no winter clothes. They uh, they hadn't figured on that, you see. So they had, as I have since read, uh, the winter clothes were not a priority when they got the ports mm -hmm. because the, the army was moving so well they were they the hell with that we we're, we're going to get through with this by christmas pushing and through. and uh, uh, put the uh, food and the and the shells and the ammunition and things like that and so we had no overshoes uh i i i, I was able i was lucky i had a a pair of regular uh heavy uh I had a um, like a sweatshirt, with, but it was you know like a, like an un under mm -hmm. underwear shirt. Have you had that? And I had uh, OD pants, uh, you know, wool uniform pants. Right. And uh, I had a pair of coveralls, and I had a sweater, and my combat jacket, and I found a scarf. And, uh, what about gloves? Uh, we, we had gloves, but they weren't warm. 
Yeah. They were not warm. And a funny thing, my father, my father was a leather sorter in a glove shop in Johnstown. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And uh, he sent me a beautiful pair of heavy mittens. And that was great, except when I, I wrote to him, I said, gee, Dad, that was great. They're nice and warm. They came in handy. The only problem, no trigger finger. Uh -huh. <laughs> of course, with a machine gun, on a 30 caliber machine gun, you feigned it anyway. You didn't pull the trigger. Oh, yeah. You just got, kind of hit the... Uh -huh. And you, and, and you hit it easy because you couldn't keep it going. You, did, you only in bursts. Mm -hmm. In bursts. But with the gloves, yeah, they gave us gloves, but they, they were not they were not warm enough in that in that climate. We'd had those, but no, but no winter clothes, no overshoes. That was like now some guys that, that that came in later from replacement depots. Yes, they 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 had some things, and they gave them overcoats. Of course, you couldn't wear an overcoat in the tank. You couldn't get in and out of the. You could not maneuver. You couldn't get in and out of the turret or out of the bow gunner side mm -hmm. with a, with an overcoat, heavy overcoat. You could not. And anyway, that's what I had. Oh, cold. Oh man, I remember the cold, huh? Never was so cold ever in my life, ever. I, and, and, and it just stayed cold, you know, day and night. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, how are you going to get warm? Where are you going to get warm? You know, those guys and the, the the infantry guys, infantry guys, um, you know, digging their holes. That was tough because the like ground, four or five pictures came out. ground was frozen. Uh huh. Boy, you'd have to chop. But that's that's where they lived, and they lived in their holes, and we lived in the tank. <laughs> That was a pretty brutal winter too, I guess. Oh, uh, I guess I. One well, of the worst I, ones oh, that they had there in memory. Oh, terrible. Oh, I don't. I have never. I've never ever been that cold. Huh? Been that cold. <laughs> it was. It, it really. It was brutal. Miserable. And I never got old. I think uh, Dorothy, my spouse, thinks that maybe that's why I mind the cold so much to this day. I you don't, don't like the cold? Oh God, I can't take it. Can't it. Whether they had anything to do with it, I don't know. I Probably not. That's a long time ago, but man. Well, to live through that oh. for a month or at least more than a month. Oh, it was. Oh yeah, December 19th to the end of the January. Of February. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. Well, you kind of got me yapping here. I didn't. I got some more questions for you. Oh, all right. Did you ever run into any American POWs after they've been liberated, or see any camps where they were as you were pushing uh, through Germany? Or any prisoners of war that the Germans had, uh, or any uh, concentration camps or anything like that? Well, uh, I don't recall. Somehow in the back of my mind, near the end of the war, as we were moving you know, toward Berlin, I'll call yeah. it. Uh, as I recall, yeah, we would see some uh, former POWs who had, because we overran places, they were walking back toward the rear. But I don't recall ever. I don't recall talking to him, but I, but in the back of my mind, I remember mm -hmm. now seeing kind of columns. Mm -hmm. uh, the, they were going uh, in one direction. You were yeah going towards yeah the right action. Yeah, we and we knew they were free and and were on their way back to be taken care of. Now at the end of the uh, after the war was over, uh, we participated in. Um, transporting uh, like uh, Polish and Russian slave laborers that they would be some some place and we put them in trucks to transport them to some other destination mm -hmm. on their way back home and I can I can remember uh, I can remember a particular uh, uh, 
I, I think they were probably Polish, maybe Russian uh, girls, ladies. Mm -hmm. Boy, they were husky and strong, and that's why they were they were there, and they 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 were not emaciated. They had they were big and strong and able to and able to work. I imagine they were uh, agricultural workers, even, mm -hmm. but I don't know that. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we did encounter we did encounter those people, and there they were. They had been taken from their homes mm -hmm. and brought into Germany and, mm -hmm. and put to work. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't recall ever talking to them because you had a language barrier on you. Sure, yeah. Have you ever been back? No. Do you have any desire to go? To I would places? like to, but I never will. No. No? Too old. Yeah, I would, I, I would really, I would really like to. To see some of those places? And yeah. Oh, I'd love to. What do you think about the German people today? Uh, I don't... Are there any feelings still there? I mean, what did you think about them then? They were the enemy then. Yes. And the war ended. There they were. They were still there. Yeah. I, um, I can remember at the time uh, resenting the Germans for uh, interrupting my life, right. and I was very Must resentful have. about that because I, because it brought changes in my life mm -hmm. that I'm not going to get into, but mm -hmm. uh, which weren't always so nice. Well, that must have been a pretty common feeling, I would think. Yeah. From. Uh, but I, uh, I don't have any uh, feeling of antipathy toward the uh, German people now at all, mm -hmm. but I do toward the Japanese. Do I you? don't like the Japs. Mm -hmm. I didn't like them then. I don't like them now. Mm -hmm. I don't trust them. And I, as far as the Germans are concerned, mm -hmm. I would uh, want them on my side now. Sure. And uh, I had admiration, I think, for the way they could fight. Well, they certainly had it down, didn't they? Didn't they? Boy, they were good. <laughs> and, uh, I've spoken to a lot of gentlemen who were in the Pacific Theater. Well, a lot of them feel the same way you do. About them. Yeah. As far as, uh, you know, what they had to go through. And, you know, another standard question I'll ask is, uh, do you remember where you were and how you felt when you heard that the war, well, the, that uh, the atomic bombs had been dropped. Were yeah. you in Germany oh, oh, then? No, I was on my way home. I was in La Havre, France, when they were you? when the first bomb was and was were you, dropped. Were you, were you to be shipped home? Were you, were you to be shipped over in that general direction? I was to be shipped uh, home, get a 30-day furlough, mm -hmm. report back to Fort Knox, from Fort Knox to the Pacific coast. Mm -hmm from the Pacific coast to the Philippines and to be assigned uh, as a platoon leader of a, of a platoon of tanks to get ready for the invasion of Japan. Yeah. That's, so what, that's where I was on my way. Couldn't believe it. And I had, you know, I'd had all kind of combat experience, which was why I was being shipped. Oh, they I, I couldn't believe it. Sure. Yeah. I thought, I, and, and of course, I could not have survived anymore. I was a fugitive from the law of averages as it was. Right. That's a good saying. <laughs> and they weren't smart. I'll tell you something. They weren't smart about assigning me to uh, lead some platoon in the invasion of Japan because I think I would have found a way to mm -hmm. put sand in the oil tank or something. Good Lord. You know, enough is enough. Yeah. Yeah, I was a little resentful about that. But uh, I, got the, uh, I got the 30 days. And, they, and, they, and because the war had ended by then, and, and they extended to 45 days. I had a 40 day, 45 day furlough. I did report back to Fort Knox. I had enough points to get out, and I got out. I see. And was I glad they dropped the bomb? You bet your life. And I'm so glad to this day that they dropped that bomb. Yeah. 
and I have no problem with it. None. Morally, ethically, whatever. That's interesting. I'm reading a book by, uh, well, it's a book of a Oregon journalist who went out and he met uh, Paul Tibbetts, the commander of the you know, Gay. Yes, 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 yes. It's pretty interesting because he's he's in his early 80s now. Yes. And of course he's a retired general. And uh, you know, we talked about his feelings, morally ethics. We had a job to do. That's it. We had to get it done. Yes, we did. And, uh, but surprisingly, he, he doesn't have any bad feelings for the Japanese people. In fact, he drives a Toyota. Is that right? Isn't that something? Isn't that something? <laughs> yeah. Which I never would do. No? No. No. No, sir. I don't want anything to do with them. Have you seen uh, the movie Pearl Harbor? No. Plan on seeing it? No. Why? Uh, I, um, nor did I see uh, Saving Private Ryan. No, you didn't see uh, that. I think uh, it, those things kind of bother me now that I'm mm -hmm. uh, older and, I, and I'm not sure that, uh, <laughs> I, I just, I, I, uh, I don't want to go through it. I can't. I, 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 it bothers me now. I'm, I'm, I'm old, and, and uh, do you think it'll bring back a lot of the feelings that you had done? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I felt. You just I don't think I felt as bad, or as um, uh, squeamish about yeah. these things then as I do now. Right. Well, like you said, you had a That's job age, to do. See, and. Sure. Uh, uh, I don't know, just the, the, the noise and the, yeah, I think it might bother me a little bit, but that, uh, but I, but I've heard that uh, Pearl Harbor wasn't the greatest movie. I haven't seen it. <clears throat> I, I've, I've read an awful lot about it that it, they, they, they say Private, uh, Saving Private Ryan was, was very well done and yeah. quite, quite uh, uh, factual or, mm -hmm. or, you know, realistic, realistic. Yeah, that seemed to be pretty good. Of course, yeah. I wasn't there. I couldn't tell you how realistic it was, but well, I, I've it wasn't a John Wayne movie. Let's put it that no. way. I can remember when uh, crossing the channel, and 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 I landed at uh, at Omaha Beach, Did not you? on D Day, right. as I told you. But the thing that impressed me, and, and of course, when when I got there, they didn't have any. Wharfs or anything had to walk in in the water through the water to the beach, and I looked at those cliffs and, uh, and the pillboxes. I couldn't believe it. That they had to go. How the hell did these guys? They had every square inch of that beach there, yeah. right? methodically, like you said. Yeah. And and uh, and I can remember uh, we we. Uh, uh, Across the beach and went up winding path, path up yeah. mining. They still had some of the mines that okay. they had to be careful, you know. They had knew where they were and they got a lot of them out and they had to pass through but that, 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 that was very impressive to me. <laughs> <laughs> sure it was. But I but I but I just happened to think about looking at that. I couldn't believe it. Could not believe it. They had well, how they did it? No, and they did it. They, they did. It. A couple of the tanks of the 743rd Tank Battalion were were quite instrumental in helping to save the situation that day. Oh, really? By the way, yeah. And they don't mention that much. I read that somewhere too. Yeah. They were unloading tanks on D-Day. 743rd tank. Some tanks went in on D-Day. Oh yeah. 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 On the beach. Oh yeah. Yeah. And they got landed by uh, the LSTs and whatever. Yeah. 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 Just to get them off the beach, or something. Huh? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Did you I've met quite a few gentlemen who are 
there on June 6th from this area. Yeah. Yeah. That hit the beach, you mean? Yeah. 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 They yeah. hit the beach or right off the beach. Right. A couple of them were in the Coast Guard. They played a pretty important role. Transporting things back and yeah. forth. Yeah, right. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, they looked to tell about it. A lot of them didn't, though. A lot of them didn't. I haven't been to France. That's the amazing thing that yeah. so many survived. Gee, you'd wonder what, what you were you're there. You'd think, my God, how can anybody get out of this? Right. But more got out than didn't. Well, that's what they say about the Americans, though. These Germans were so methodical, and sometimes when the head got cut off, yeah, they were paralyzed. Yeah, as far right. as a commanding officer, whereas your junior officers and you know even some of your enlisted men were just taking control of the situation yeah. as it deteriorated because they knew. It was that or yep. die. Sure, sure. And that's uh, you know, part of the reason I think they did get off the beach that day. No question about that. Yes, the uh, the American enlisted man could take over. Right. Yeah. 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 Not so much in Germans. But that was their whole system, I think, too. They're from such an authoritarian. Oh man. By yeah. the book. Yeah. Do it this way. Yeah. Whereas the Americans are a little bit more uh, venom, I guess, or yeah, casual about something. Yeah. But but, it, but more independent in their culture. Exactly. Exact. In their whole thinking. Yeah. Right. Yes. Not ready to take orders, but ready to take control too when the time yeah. came. Yeah. 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 Can you think of any questions you want to ask your grandpa? Have you heard these stories before? Not all of them. No? Some of them. I remember the cold. He goes down to Florida during the winter because he doesn't like the cold. Sure, it gets cold up here. <laughs> well, that's great. We're doing a... I interviewed a gentleman from this community and... Uh, Obviously, I ran into your daughter, and she told me about you, and uh, your son-in-law. They told me you didn't like the Japanese, so I had to ask that question, too. Actually, you, 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 wanted, you, wanted, didn't you? you wanted to confirm that. <laughs> I yeah. did. I just can't understand. It's a different culture. It's the Oriental mind, but how, how people can treat other people like they did. Well, they now, I know them. what uh, Hitler and that crowd did to the Jewish people, and I can't, and the older I get, the worse that gets to me. I can't, not, another uh, movie, Schindler's List, I can't oh. see that anymore. I saw it once, and I don't want to me. I don't want to see any of those things anymore. <laughs> I don't want to no, back away, but I just, and, and, and Dorothy's the same way, we, we can't, Gee, you want to look at it? No, we can't. We can't take it. And, and, uh, I can't fathom it. Yeah, but the, no, no, you can't. How, how, how could, how could anybody do such right. a thing? But I mean, it would be one thing if, if they just decide to kill them, but to degrade them, to treat, to put them in those camps, mm -hmm. and to do what they did and treat them. Gee, man, and the chaps were the same way. <clears throat> but, they, the but they did it to, look what they did to the Chinese and to, to the Koreans. Yeah. Uh, and, and just absolute cruelty. Golly. Yeah. Say it's sadistic. Well, that's, and things you read about when uh, they got a hold of an American prisoner during a battle. The things they would do. <clears throat> Pardon? <clears throat> I was reading, uh, the book on Iwo Jima there, Flags of Our Fathers. Yeah, yeah, I've read that yet. I want to read that. That's a good read. Yeah. But there's some passages in there that'll definitely be disturbing. Because you know? it's told by the son of the Navy corpsman. Yeah. Who was one of the flag raisers. And he was the one who led the most stable life afterwards. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Three of the six were killed before they got off the island. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other two... Well, one of them drank himself to death yeah. ten years later, and the other one uh, just kind of faded into oblivion, didn't live too much. I think he died in the 70s. Mm. 
the last one was the one who, uh, you know, he went home and lived in a nice community, but he would never talk about it. Yeah. The reporters would call him up and talk yeah. about it. Right. Because they had to go on that big tour, the war bond tour. Oh, yeah. They get called right home to do yeah. that, to raise yeah. the money once the picture was taken. Right. And, uh, he passed away and the stories by the son going back and tracing his father's footsteps. And uh, just getting the stories and piecing together the life stories of these six guys that were just drawn together by that one yeah. quirky yeah. moment. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. It's a good, good book. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes. I'm, I want to read that. But after you read it, you're not going to feel any different about what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> you, it'll just confirm what you... <laughs> you already harbor deep down inside. Well, the guy who lives down the street from me in Florida was a... Uh, a prisoner. He was a baton guy, was he? Death march. and uh, he uh, he was a mine worker. Jeez. Worked in the mines. Slave labor. Earl Henkin, and he's the nicest guy, and uh, you, you'd never know. And he's he, he's friendly and fun. And had a good life and nice family, but I don't think he's too happy about some of those japs or the way they treated him. You know. Jeez. Yeah. Well, I got a hold of a gentleman who passed away about 20 years ago. He was on, uh, he lived in Glens Falls, and his son forwarded me his story. He was on one of those hell ships. Oh, gee. Whereas the, uh, the Japanese were transporting to Japan because the yeah. Americans were closing it. Right. And uh, there were 750 guys on it, Americans. And. Of course, the Japanese didn't mark the vessels, and they were down in this tank, you know, they were down in these holes for weeks at a time. Yeah. And, uh, and they'd get strafed and... Well, and they got sunk. They got hit by an American torpedo. Okay. And uh, his father was one of 83 guys who managed to survive. No kidding. You, yeah. you, see, isn't that amazing that there would be survivors? Even? Exactly. Well, what a terrible thing. Yeah, they transported these guys knowing that that could happen. Oh, they knew it was. Sure. Oh. That'd be one way to get rid of their load. That's right. That's right. I read, um, hey, did you ever read uh, Studs Turkle's The oh, yeah. War? Oh, well, I got that book. And, yes, and, and uh, I, I went to a uh, book discussion about that just recently. Did you? Yeah, in Johnstown. Johnstown Library had it, and, and it was a uh, professor from uh, Albany. Uh, uh, State University okay. at Albany. His name was um, Edelman, I think, and uh, he was. And and, they, and we're going to have a discussion on Brokaw's book. Oh, yeah. Which uh, yeah. Edelman found. I don't like Brokaw, and uh, he found it what? He f uh, uh, he found that Brokaw's book was. Not the depth of no. uh, of uh, Studs no, Turkle. Did you read Brokaw's? Yeah. Read both. Yeah. Yeah, and he said that uh, Brokaw, but we kind of superficial almost. Yeah, I agree. And then uh, he felt, you know, he wrote that maybe just to make a good buck on, on the thing. Well, I think he's doing the country service in a sense, though, because he's certainly uh, there's a lot of people who don't know what you went through. There's yeah. a lot of people who think that old ball is a Diet. Yeah, it was uh, yeah. John Wayne. No, I. How about um, how about uh, what was the what was the uh, Kojak's name? Telly Savalas. Telly Savalas. Yeah. He was the tank commander in that in that one movie. Did you see that movie? Oh, yeah. That was great. That was funny. <laughs> the Dirty Dozen. I think. Well, no, that was the Dirty Dozen. I think that was that was the one uh, with Telly Savalas. It might have been. Uh, might have been the Battle of the Bulge or something. That might have been yeah, with Henry Fonda and, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and Ryan, Robert Ryan, and yeah. <laughs> I didn't see that. I like Telly. He, he was, oh, he was great too. in that, boy. He, he had all kinds of goods and stuff that he had Cigar stored. And then he was, yeah, he was mad because the Germans bombed it or something. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, but that, that's, that was good, that Studge Turkle's book. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. The guy who lives here in Hudson Falls, Dan Lawler, who was uh, one of the first Marines. He was at Peleliu and Okinawa. 
And there's one gentleman in the book, Sledgehammer. So E B yeah. Sledge yeah. Hammer. That was in, in, uh, in the book. Yeah. 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 Well, he knew him. Is that right? Living at 10 across from him. Isn't that something? And he was a southern guy, and he used to make fun of him. He used to call him rebel, and he used to get him all angry. And... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I recently saw him in a TV show, too. But I guess he passed away. Huh. There was a big... Um, there was a... There was a big difference between the southern boys and the northern boys, too. There was a a difference, difference. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and uh, let me tell you, they uh, they filled the combat troops with those southern boys too, baby. They wanted them in there. Why? Because they knew they because they were uh, knew how to shoot emotional a gun. and knew how to handle it. And they were emotional and gung ho and uh, like guns. Backwards. And would go. Yeah. 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 Plus Irish, plus Italian. Well, they you're Irish, to, aren't you? Yeah, they liked it. They liked the Irish. They liked the Italian. They liked the Southern boys. Emotional types. Oh yeah. 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 They weren't going to have too many cold, calculating, smart guys who know enough not to go. <laughs> <laughs> they were one of them dumbbells that would get all excited and go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they got them. Oh God! You'd wonder. You, well, I've often thought about that. Thought, my God, why would you go when they told you? Why would they? You know what was coming, but you went. Couldn't say no. No, I guess not. No. There was just something about it that. Yeah. Well, I think you had a. I think you had an obligation, and you knew it, and you weren't going to let. The guy's down, that's all you are. That's what I keep hearing, you know. We're going to do that. Wasn't happy about it. Didn't want to go. Went. Yeah. Couldn't do anything else. There it was. All right. Did you, did yeah. you mention the train at all? That was kind of interesting. What? The train, just before. No, I didn't the... tell him about the train. What's that? Well, uh, Late in the war, again, that nice, beautiful April days, mm -hmm. we were shooting like crazy across the top of Germany. And um, uh, a Major Benjamin of the 743rd was kind of out ahead scouting a little bit and uh, came across some uh, Finnish. Finland, Finnish right. soldiers who had been POWs and and uh, were just wandering, had you know got out of the camp because they'd been overrun or whatever, and told them that there was some kind of a a, a train uh, approaching. I don't know whether they knew what was on that train or not. I'm not sure, but uh, he came back to the. Uh, battalion, and he pulled my tank and George Gross's tank out and uh, told us to uh, go with him. So we did, and and uh, we came uh, uh, to uh, uh, a place where where there was a long train uh, uh, of uh, boxcars, mm -hmm. and uh, so my recollection is that the, that the uh, Firemen and the and the engineer on the on the on the train jumped off some distance from us as we were approaching, and I can remember seeing them running, and I can remember I can remember firing the 30 caliber at them just why not they were German you, you know, and of course see every third uh, shell in, in, a, in a belt is is a tracer, so you can see you know oh well, we didn't get them. But anyway, I can remember pulling up alongside the, the train, the boxcars, Grossi and I, and Major Benjamin. Well, as it turned out, it was a, uh, a train full of, uh, of concentration camp uh, uh, personnel, uh, prisoners. victims, prisoners, who were being transported from one of their camps, uh, I think it had been Belson. I think they'd been in Belson, 
and uh, as I have subsequently learned, and on their way to another camp, trying to get ahead of the... Uh, Stay ahead of you guys. Uh, yeah, exactly. So there they were, and uh, my God, I knew we didn't know what they were, and we got the doors open, and uh, or maybe they had been open from what I get from Gross, and all these people, men, women, children, jam-packed in those Bosch cars, and uh, couldn't believe my eyes, and uh, there they were. So uh, they got up. now. Now they know they're free. They're liberated. See, and that was a nice, nice thing. And I was there for a while that afternoon. Well, you know, you got to feed these people. Uh -huh. Water. They're, they're they're in bad shape. And uh, Major Benjamin took some pictures, and so did George Gross took some pictures too. And I have those. I have copies of those pictures are down in Florida. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, I didn't stay there uh, the rest of the day late that I went back. And I was kind of glad to go back. I thought, gee, I hope they get, you know, the proper authorities, the proper military uh, uh, companies that would take care of mm -hmm. people like this. Uh, but Grossi had his tank there all that night. And there was a, uh, and um, recently, in the, th because we were with the 30th Infantry Division so long, uh, they consider the 743rd Tank Battalion as part of the 30th. In fact, at the end of the war, they gave us their patch to wear mm -hmm. on our right sleeve. Your own patch, the armored like or infantry mm -hmm. patch, whatever, would always be on the left sleeve of your uniform. We got the 30th Division Old Hickory on our right. And I get the newsletter from the 30th Infantry Division, and there was a uh, letter. They have letters from sometimes from people over in Europe. Do you know anything about this? Or I remember the Americans coming through, and there was somebody, blah, blah, whatever. So there was this letter from this young man who said uh, he was on the death train near some place or other. Uh, and he gave the date in April of 1945. Uh, did anybody know anything about or have a I don't know what there was, but anyway, I thought, geez, I think I'll bet you that's that train that, that we came across. Well, as it turned out, it was. So I wrote to the <clears throat> editor of the 30th Division mm -hmm. magazine or paper, and I told him about Gross, who would know more about it, because he was there all night and into the right. next day. and. Uh, some, the, the, there was a tank destroyer battalion nearby too, and they got that tank destroyer battalion, and they got them to go to all the surrounding people, German people in the air, and made them come up with food and water and everything for these people. And, uh, and apparently there were some uh, uh, German soldiers that had been on guard of that train that had disappeared. They weren't there when we got there. They must have seen us coming. But they found them later on too. And uh, anyway, um, so uh, uh, Gross has email. He's got one of the uh, computers. Oh, yes. And this this guy, who he was five years old on that train, Jeez. lives in London. So they got in contact with each other. And they got in contact with each other. And I and I just got a whole bunch of that stuff. He sent me copies of all the uh, correspondence they've had so far about, <laughs> about that drink. And Gross, my friend Gross, who, who uh, you know, started out as a bow gunner and ultimately came on in the same crew with me as the gunner, later got his own tank. He was an English major who later became a professor Ultimately, I think he taught in high school, and then he got, he was a professor of, of English literature, particularly uh, uh, English uh, uh, 19th century poetry huh. at San Diego That's State. Good. Yep, and he's retired, he's a professor emeritus there. And uh, so, but he, he writes like it's a novel or a story. When he writes to this guy he's talking about, you can imagine the emotion I felt when when I saw these poor people mm -hmm. in their emaciated way, and he, oh my God, it's like 
<laughs> it's beautiful the way he goes on about it. And we, and we didn't write for years, but we have taken up correspondence in the last four or five years, and it's been quite interesting. But uh, yeah, that was in that was. Did he live in Florida? No, he lives in San Diego, California. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I did see him about five years ago, wasn't it? We went to California. Went out, yeah. To, yeah, to see him to and, a, him. and a boyhood friend. Pardon? To meet him in particular? Yes, yes. And a boyhood friend and and Gross. Yeah, Jesus. they both lived in the same area. We spent about ten days out there. Mm -hmm. Had a very nice time. Probably never see each other again. He won't fly. Oh, yeah. He will not fly. I didn't tell you that. He won't fly. No. I said, why the hell don't you take a train? I <laughs> Come see me. I went to see you. It's oh, a long train ride, too. <laughs> yeah. Be an interesting one. I'd like to take that. Now, I'd like to take that train ride sure. and, and stop here and there, you know, take my time. But anyway, that was about it. But those people, yeah, and they got those pictures. There, there's a picture of a little boy. But it wasn't. It wasn't the guy. Grossy asking if, if uh, that, that was. Him. Yeah, he thought he recognized somebody from. Uh, his mother was on that train. The boy was his mother. Mm -hmm. I think his father had died in Belson, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a there was a um, Polish girl, I think, who could speak English very well. That George Gross had a lot of conversation with that afternoon and, 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 and that night, you know, when he was still there. But he never he never heard from her again. I think he knew her name too, but whatever happened to her. Mm -hmm. But this young man, this five-year-old, uh, is in the medical field somehow. He was in London. Oh. And he they were hung, uh, primarily Hungarian Jews on that train. And he got back to Hungary only to be uh, confronted with the uh, Russia yeah. he got out. Yeah. So do you have copies of those pictures, said? Of those pictures? I have, I yeah, they sent me copies of them, yeah. I got caught in Florida. Maybe someday I could look at them. Yeah, I, I guess know. you can get those, you can get copies made now. You can make copies. There's and a place in Johnstown that, where I can go and they, and they like that card. Yes. <clears throat> The one that you wouldn't put in color, yes. But I did put in color because your mother and I, your mother and you told me how cheap I was. <laughs> there was a great card that said, someday we'll look back on all of this, you know, and they open up. They open up. And puke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that card. God, I love it. I lo oh, that's a great card. <laughs> but yeah, you could get, down in Florida, I'm sure they have a place that yeah, you could get. Yeah, I can find out if it's like that place, because I just go yeah. in and, and they reproduce these yeah, pictures. Yeah, like a park. Yeah. yeah. But one question I, I have is, well. um, when you came back, you said you went back to Fort Knox. Yes. After that, what did you do to go back? Did you go back to Johnstown? No, I went back to... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I came back and finished law school. I had that semester yet to do in law school. Mm -hmm. Even though you passed the bar, you still had to go back? Even though I passed the bar. I didn't I have enough that. time. You, you still had to have oh. required time. I didn't graduate from law school until January of 1946. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> As of the class of 43. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So after that, you just went on on your own separate way. You never did anything with the army again. No, <clears throat> didn't want to. <laughs> no. They said uh, when I was getting out of Fort Knox, they, you know, going through all the stuff. Okay, boys, right over here. What's over there? Well, that's where you sign up for the reserve, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. And uh, so I didn't move over there. Everybody went over like a flock of sheep. So the guy says. Okay, Mac, over here for the reserve. I said, no, thanks. What do you mean? Aren't you going to join the reserve? No. Why, he says, do you realize if you're not in reserve, you could be drafted as a private? I said, let me tell you something. I said, two things. I was a private for two years, and I survived, and I suspect I could survive again. But I tell you something else, I don't intend to be drafted again, I told him. <laughs> And all those guys got called back in Korea. 
Oh my God. Sure, if you were in the reserves, my friend Gross, Mr. G.I. Gross, of course he had to get in the reserve, and didn't he get called, you know, to serve in Korea? Fortunately, he had some, I don't know, something wrong with him, knees or <laughs> something, and so he didn't, he didn't have to go, but he got called. Oh man. Did, no, did you tell I him had enough the, of that. Did Pardon? you tell him about the doctor that was very kind to you when he gave you the bad news? <laughs> no, I didn't tell him that's that. That's funny. I think that's good. Well, <laughs> Elizabeth Leonard, well, I was a non-combatant, by the way. Non-combatant is uh, somebody in the Army who has certain disabilities that they, that they're, they would not be able to participate in combat. So I was at, at uh, Camp Meade, Fort Meade, near Baltimore. And uh, this was uh, kind of a final physical to determine whether you would go overseas or whatever. Just for the, so that kindly old doctor was there and he says, I uh, had my physical, which, which never was much, you know, mm -hmm. but test your heart. Okay. He says, young man, I have bad news for you. And I thought, well, okay. He's going to tell me that there's a boat right out there in Chesapeake Bay ready to go to Africa or Italy or someplace, and you're going to be on it in about 10 minutes. But he says, you'll never fight for your country. <laughs> and I thought, well, that may not be so bad after all. I'm not going to argue too much, but he said, I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to let you go overseas. He said, they'll have to find some kind of non-combatant duty for you, whatever it might be, working in an office, working on the wharves, I don't like, whatever. He said, I'm going, to, I'm going to do you a favor and let you go overseas. Okay. So I went overseas, and of course that's the last I ever heard about any job except uh, getting combat because it just kept moving until mm -hmm. I reached the 743rd tank battalion. And on my, my service record says not come back. Mm -hmm. And they would get that they'd get that out every once in a while. <laughs> 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 Wise guys, you know, they'd say stuff like Now gentlemen, it got you know, we every I don't know how old because you didn't see headquarters company much or the company clerk or something, the first sergeant, and they'd say, gentlemen I want you to know we have a real hero among us, someone who does not have to be here, but who has volunteered to give his offer, and then they they go into detail. Of course, I would bow and acknowledge all the <laughs> all the uh, accolades, you know, from being a hero. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but I'm 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 going to do you a favor. He says. <laughs> but it wasn't uh, it wasn't a wise move because as I said to Elizabeth, and I said you know. If you hit a mine or something, that could have blown my glasses off. Not hurt me or anything, but you know, just a concussion. I'm the tank commander. Now, who do I command? How do I command if I can't see? Yeah. So is that one of you to you? Pardon? For your eyesight? That's what. That's what. That's, that's what. The, it was? Yeah. That's why I was. Yeah. Because no, of yeah. my eyesight. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. You don't think about little things like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's why I was classified as non-combatant. But hey, I was a warm body. Yeah. Who the hell cares? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. I because I saw it. Mm -hmm. I saw it. Yeah. Non-combatant stamped in two or three places, <laughs> but it didn't mean anything. <laughs> Do you have pictures of yourself? You must. Have yeah, I you saw them that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Send one of those, too. Mm -hmm. That's a nice one of you when you were young with your with your jacket on that mom doesn't let want to touch. <laughs> nice one. Yeah. Got about eight pictures. Yeah. All right. Well, well, he got me talking. I don't hope That's it good. I don't know what time it is. What time is it now? It's about 1.15. Oh, no no problem good. to me. <clears throat> There's no problem to you, there's no problem to me. No, that's I, hope it's, I hope it's what you wanted. Exactly what I wanted. See, this is what I'm going to do. 
<coughs> they continue, and uh, we'll make a videotape of it. Give the family a copy of it, just for old time's sake. I'll keep a copy of it, and uh, when Sean comes into 10th grade, he'll have to go to work on it. <laughs> what I do is I have students who, uh, who will actually uh, watch the tape and they'll transcribe it, they'll type out text to it. Uh -huh. So by the time we're done, <clears throat> we'll get the text all laid out, and then I go through and I edit it, you know. I'll take out, you know, the part where we're scratching our head, thinking of words or something. <laughs> I'll get a good, nice narrative going, and then... Uh, and we'll publish it, kind of in the fashion of Studs Turkow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we uh, probably put it on the web, and we'll have hyperlinks to it, meaning uh, where you're talking about the story of the train and the people. If I can get a picture, the person will see that sentence, all they have to do is click on it, and yeah. that picture will come right up. Right. Or it'll be in there in the text. Right. And, you can't uh, get it till November. That's all right, because he's not going to be in 10th grade this year anyway. Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm just collecting my stories now. Yeah. I'll send this stuff up to Sean and he yeah, can that'd be great. get in touch with you. That'd be good. And then we also mentioned um, if you wanted him when he's in 10th grade to bring in the flag, because my dad has a flag that he wasn't supposed to bring home. Was it a Nazi flag? Yeah. So, yeah. But he he does what do you want mean that. Mean it wasn't supposed to bring home. Why was it a souvenir? Supposed souvenir. To. Oh, sure. I thought you weren't supposed no, to. No, it was a souvenir. Oh, was this grandma that had it? <laughs> grandma had it. Grandma Douse, your mother's mother. Mm -hmm. My mother-in-law had a big one. I, oh, oh yeah, huge. it's a you know, it's a it's a big um, yeah. Let's see, big. It's all white, isn't it, with the red. I don't know if I've seen the flag. I've only sticker. seen your armband. Yeah, yeah I, I got know. an armband. Mm -hmm. Got an armband. I like that armband because I like to put that on so then I can say, "You will ask me for dinner or whatever." <laughs> oh yeah. Third grade, huh? Yeah, I got it in a sent, had a shell case. I put it wrapped it up in the shell case, and nailed it home. Of course, it he didn't hardly want to touch it, but. But Grandma wanted to air it out, but she didn't dare put it on the line. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a gentleman I met down in Albany who uh, used me infantry. He got one of those big regimental Nazi battle flags. Yeah. And uh, he sent it home to his mother. His mother sent it out to get it dry clean. Yeah. Next thing they knew, they had the FBI knocking on the door. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, they. Dorothy's mother was smarter than that. She just kept, oh dear. Oh, I guess they didn't want to touch it or anything, you know, they're afraid of it. Yeah, it was, it was in, uh, I, it came off, uh, we, we, yeah, that was when you wondered where to get any prisoners. Yeah, that was when we did. I remember you told me. We knocked out a half track it was, and they had, and that was on it. Of course, we'd loot anything there was. Don't, you better not mention stuff sure. like that. But they all did. All you guys did. I We're all it. out for it. Did we? Uh, we My did. favorite was when we Papa told me about we could. How, we, how they'd huh? steal all their love letters and read them out loud to everybody from the guys in the <laughs> tank that were dead. <laughs> you had some fun, didn't you? Oh, sure. Sure. You probably had to make some fun out of it because yep, it was so, sure. so awful. So important. Yeah. That tape in there? Just still going? Yeah, so cool. Yeah. Did you bring a tape? Yes, it's oh, that's it. Well, I had to take I, yeah, I, I, I didn't know out. if he had I popped that one in. Okay.